Well, God bless you too. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you. Yeah. We applaud you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I love him. I said I love him. Oh, you got one foot in the water. Hallelujah. I said you got one foot in, one foot out. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give one more hand clap of praise. Then. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. It's certainly good to be home. I was back this morning, but I had to I had to go do something for business. I had to I had to get to Houston this morning or I would have been here for this morning. I guess I gave watch the rerun. Um sounded like you had a good time. Amen. I don't want to spoil the the move of God. Amen. They just move me out of the way first. Praise God, but I, you know, God was dealing with me this morning, and and uh, you know, uh, I feel like I have a word for somebody tonight. Um, you know, I don't know exactly quite how to express it. I'm not, you know, most of you that know me, I'm a teacher. I like to teach. I get my preach on from time to time, but uh, you know, the most important thing is the end result when we get in the presence of God. Amen. Whether it be the praise, whether it be the worship, or the Word of God. I mean, the Word of God is the thing that moves me. Amen. You can jump, and you can shout, and you can dance, and all that's fine and good, but I need to hear the Word of God. That's the thing. That's the motivating factor for Brother Bybee. Hallelujah. Amen. But you get a good beat for somebody, and you begin to, you know, come, here comes the, the storm, and hallelujah, they start singing, and boom, they take off running. Hey, hallelujah, we end up the same place. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. But uh, I never have let, you know, worship be the one thing that gets me in, alone, that gets me into the presence of God. I just, you know, and uh, and the reason is, is I've heard, uh, I've seen so many uh, churches, I've been to so many places where they would uh, worship God and they would talk in tongues and I'd feel the move of God. But when the preaching, when it came to the preaching, it was way off the mark. They would, weren't even in the Word of God when they preached. And so that for me, as a young minister, that was something that really turned me off. The thing that really, really, really got me when I was young in the Word of God was, was the revelation of Jesus Christ, seeing it and understanding it in the Word of God. So to me, that's the you know, real important thing to me. Um, we were up in Tennessee, and we had a really good time while we were up there. And uh, I was kind of set aside when I went to go preach. And uh, you know, God gave me a word for somebody up there, and we really had a good time. And... Uh, you know, so if you would have it, you would listen to me tonight. If you would receive anything, let it not be from me. Let it be from the word of the Lord. Let God speak to our hearts tonight. You know, it's not so much the messenger. We need not look at the messenger, but we need to look at, at him, the king. Amen. Hallelujah. If I could take a passage of scripture tonight out of Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7. Amen. Verses 1 through 3. Hallelujah. And it says this, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for he is his mercy endureth forever. Amen. His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I love you, God. I praise you. I just ask, God, that you'd anoint these lips of clay, anoint our hearts and our ears, God, that we would hear and receive something from you tonight, God. 
We love you, God. We're here, God, just to magnify you and to, to try to draw closer to you. And, if, and, Lord, become more like you, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open, Lord, and sensitive to what you would have for our lives. God, I give you praise and glory and honor in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Please be seated. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to preach tonight from just a subject of what you see is what you get. Amen. Hey! <laughs> hey! All right! <laughs> Look back, it's there. Praise God. What you see is what you get. You know, while I was you know, sitting there worshiping, I was listening to the song. I, I was brought back to a time when I was... You know, I was I say young in the word. To me, young in the word was must be really young for some of you. I haven't I've been living for God since nineteen ninety nine when I got out of prison. But I remember a time I was hearing a, an evangelist from uh, uh, actually he's a missionary from Africa and he was telling a story about how um, the the parents of, of of tribes they would have they have children and, and the way they identify those children were at a very, from a very young child, they would take it and they would they would take some sharp, very sharp edge, not cutting the skin, but they would begin to draw on the lines, uh, lines on the face of their children, and begin to, to mark their children when they're very young, and they just, you know, over a period of time, that that scar would become a pattern on their face, and everybody in the tribe would have this type of pattern, and that's how that person was identified amongst the people and and uh you know I, I, I reflected back to that just a while ago and i just wanted to tell somebody today that the scars and the and the trials of your past life don't need to haunt you any longer i'm here to tell somebody tonight that those things that have been plaguing you all of your life they don't need to plague you any longer hallelujah i'm telling you you've been scarred if you've been run down and you've been hurt by your past life, hallelujah, God can make you clean. He can and will make you clean. Hallelujah. And when our Lord God Almighty, He marks you, He marks you and seals you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And you're no longer identified with that old life, but you're now identified with the family of God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. Can I get my water back? Y'all know me, right? Hallelujah. I like to have a good time and smile in church, and I'd make jokes. Gets me in trouble most of the time. Uh, pastor said you're preaching Sunday night. I said, what? All right. <laughs> I did something. I'm right. I'm back. I'm back on the back on the gravy train. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. It must have been a wonderful time in Solomon's temple when they had inaugurated Solomon's temple. What a wonderful thing that happened. You know, I, I can't imagine. We don't even know where the, the original foundation was to that temple. But when the when the glory of God fell on place, obviously it was such such a wonderful. Wonderful thing that the, they couldn't so much even see before them. They fell down on their faces and they began to worship God. I can only imagine, I can only imagine what it was like that day. I would look, I, I reflect back and I think it must have been like it was on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. I mean, we like to say we're in the Acts chapter 2 church, but just to be quite frank, we don't act like it. We don't act like it. Hallelujah. We jump, we shout, we, we talk in tongues, but... Hallelujah. We're only doing it in here. We're not doing it out there. Well, I'm just telling you how it is. You know, I'm just telling you how it is, you know, but uh, I would have liked to have experienced that, that, that inauguration of that temple. You know, and it was, you know, the sacrifice. They sacrificed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals and the blood. And it must have been a bloody gore. I mean, those priests, you know, they must have been working. They must have had a crew and assembly line, you know, sacrificing those animals. Hallelujah. But it pleased God in such such a way that he came down and filled the house and the temple. And the glory of God was with them. Right. Hallelujah. What happened to Israel? And I'm glad you talked brought, brought that up. I felt like, I, felt like oh, I better better watch out what I say now. Quite frankly, something happened. 
the children of Israel were not obedient to the convocations and the oracles in which God had laid out for them. You know, we have to be careful ourselves because, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. We need to be careful ourselves. Amen. I mean, we like to act. We, we say, oh, well, we know it's not conditional. We know it's not conditional covenant. Well, you don't act like it. You act like this is an unconditional covenant. Like, I'm saved and there ain't no way I'm going to get lost. Hallelujah. That's how we act. Sure. We act like we can't get lost when, in fact, we can get lost. We've been deceiving our own minds. Hallelujah. We act like the glory of God's on us, but quite frankly, is the glory of God really on you? Oh, Brother Bobby. I'll go run the pastor's office, talk to Brother Mungar about Brother Bybee. Now, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but let's just get, let's just get, be real about some things. Let's just be real about some things. I mean, Eli. You know, Eli, you know, does everybody know who Eli was? Oh, Eli was a priest. Eli was a, he was a well-known priest. A little bit of a backslider, I would say. He got so lazy and so backslid and so set in his ways, they began to let some things slip. You know, he began to let some things slip. And he had one, there's one thing he let, he let slip, God said no more. We like to say that, you know, we can always get forgiveness and we can always get back in the presence of God. I'm trying to feel y'all out right now. Because I feel God's got a word for somebody tonight. Oh, and then Eli, just one day he just decided he didn't have to fill the lamp full of oil. I guess it just, you know, I guess there had been no move of God and he hadn't been feeling the anointing. You ever been there? You ever been a place where you came to church and, you, you know, you don't feel the anointing, so you guess you're just going to go through the motions anyway? Give, oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. I heard Verbal Bean say on, on a tape of his, Verbal Bean said he wouldn't even, he just sit there and play the guitar. Hallelujah, until he's been feeling anointing. If he didn't feel anointing, he just worship. Until he felt the anointing. If he didn't feel anointing, I guess they just keep worshiping until they felt the anointing. Right, right, right. Hallelujah. Somebody's going to get anointing in this place or we ain't going to have no church. Hallelujah. But Eli let it go, go, let it go to the point where he didn't no longer uh, uh, tended to the things of God. And the Bible says in the book of Samuel that the lamp went out. And that's a whole message in itself. But the lamp went out. And it always puzzled me, well, why did he let that lamp go out? And that's the very, same, the very same time the word of the Lord then moved to Samuel. It's like he's waiting for that time for the anointing to pass from one to the other. And I believe that after that time, I believe he's completely blinded. He was completely deceived. No longer, I don't believe he, I mean, I don't, I hate to say it this way. But I think he, he pushed him to a place where he could no longer be saved. I mean, I'm be careful about saying that. I'm not, I'm, but but I'm, I'm talking about they pushed him so far from God that the anointing moves. So here we have Eli. The, the word of God goes over to, goes over to Samuel, right? And uh, Samuel, Samuel, what? He goes to ask Eli, what's Eli? Eli, what's going on? You call me? He said, no, maybe it's the word of the Lord. Lo and behold, it was the word of the Lord. God spoke to Samuel. What a wonderful thing. Okay? Then you got his two sons. His two backslid sons. When their audacity, they grab the tabernacle. We're going to go out and whoop on the Philistines. Right? They grab the tabernacle. Let's go. We're going to grab the, the Ark of the Covenant. I'm sorry. They, they took it out the battle. Did God ask them, tell them to take it out the battle? No. But all the people saw the tabernacle. It's going, or I'm sorry, he took, took, saw the Ark of the Covenant going. I keep calling, saw the Ark of the Covenant going. What did the people do? Hey! They gave a shout of triumph. Yeah! Woo! Yeah, I can't, I can't do that no more right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they shouted and shouted, victory. What did the enemy say? Oh, my God. What are we going to do now? Oh, my God. We might as well give it our all. They're bringing the ark. They must have God's anointing. We might as well just go out there. God don't want to be a slave, no Israelite. Right? What happened? They went out to the battle. Philistine said, we're going to give it our all. We're, give it all. we're all in. And guess what happened? They ended up losing the, 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 the ark. 
Off goes the ark and the Philistines. Philistines don't know what to do. They throw it in with the Dagon God, throw it in their tabernacle, find the Dagon knocked over. Hallelujah. Everyone, everyone in the town's getting emrods. I won't tell you what those are. If you don't know what those are, go, you can look it up yourself. But everyone's getting emrods in town. Hey, we gotta get rid of this thing. Hallelujah. Talk about talk about a plague. I don't, you know. So they put the ark back up on a on a on a, a deal and it goes back to back to Israel, right? Hallelujah. I mean, we're talking. I'm talking about our our history tonight. I'm talking right now. I'm just talking about our history. I'll, you'll get to where I'm. We'll eventually get to where I'm. You know. We'll get to what you see is what you get. Is that all right? I might get fired here. Hallelujah. I can just say, I say, Brother Gurley, I just haven't preaching so long, I kind of forgot how. No. Hallelujah. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We have, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of a history here we, we, you know, if we were to look at and examine. There's a lot of things we can draw from it. And, and uh, so the Ark of the Covenant... Goes, goes off to the Philistines. They say, well, let's get this thing out. And they put it on ark. It comes on back. And, you know, it's sitting in, in one of the, uh, you know, a man's uh, home for a while. And it goes through a history. And then, this, uh, you know, they, they build a, you know, Solomon's Temple. Eventually, finally, he makes it to Solomon's Temple, right? Brings it in. God he tells them to send it back. They're having all kinds of problems, not quite knowing what to do. They put it on the ark, said, let's go. We're going to go put it up right now. And it, it, one of the priests goes and steady it, and bam, strikes him dead. Oh, let's put this thing back up, <laughs> you know. And uh, quite a history. But the inauguration of this temple must have been just a, an awesome thing, a massive thing. We're talking about general conference. We're talking about, pow, wow, what a thing to, what a thing to be a part of. Hallelujah. Had such a history among the pagans that in about 63 BC, after the the Babylonian army had come into Jerusalem and had sieged it, they ransacked everything that was there, and you know, and they went into captivity for 490 years, and uh, Cyrus gives them a, a a commander. They said, "Well, let us rebuild." Let us rebuild the city and sanctuary, and eventually they rebuilt it. But it wasn't the same same sanctuary Samuel, Samuel built or Solomon. It wasn't the same temple. It was a different temple, a completely different temple altogether. And we never find in history, nor in the Word of God, the Holy Ghost and the power of God falling upon this temple. In about 63 BC, there was a a Roman ruler named Pompey who had who had taken Jerusalem and he went going to ransack it. And he had enough respect for the, uh, the oracles and the things of God not to, to take any of the furniture or any things that had pertained to the religion. But with his, with his high-minded audacity, the man walked right in. And while they're ransacking Jerusalem, it was, it was history says, and the historians say, uh, Josephus says, that the priests were just going about their daily business. As if like, hey, you know, they're just coming and ransacking and raping and killing people and they're just going about their business inside the, the, the temple like they didn't really care. They didn't, it didn't bother them none. And when this, this Pompey character, he got there, the history, I read it, the history says it. He walked right in and opened up the Holy to Holy to see what's in there. He wanted to see what the big deal was all about. He wanted to see what it was all about. And you know what he saw behind the veil in the holiest of holies? Do you know what he saw in there? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. For how many years were the priests hiding the fact that they didn't have the ark? Just going through the motions, hoping nobody would notice, or maybe, maybe just not talking about the fact that the, the ark wasn't in there. My question is, what did they do with the blood? Well, I suppose it was just once a year they walked in, they poured it on the ground, they walked back out, supposing, supposing that was the thing that pleased God. But where did the anointing go? Where did the anointing go? All this talk of this new temple and all this focus around this religious system and the oracles and convocations, everything went on in Jerusalem. Where was the ark? Where was the mercy seat? Where was the presence of God during those times? Hallelujah. 
talk about being destitute and truly without God. Not knowing their own heritage or not ever experiencing the heritage that their forefathers had experienced. When the power of God fell upon Solomon's temple, talk about revival. Ooh I'm talking about revival. Hallelujah. It was about, it was the second temple. The first temple was destroyed in about 50, 500, 538, 540, somewhere around the AD or BC. The first temple was destroyed. I don't know what this focus on the temple is. Even today, they want to focus on a physical temple. Physical temple don't mean anything. So it's, it's, it, hey, it's a temple made without hands. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't care about the Ark Covenant no more. Hallelujah. I know where his throne is at today. Hallelujah. I know where his throne is at today. You know, he had a desire to see what the big deal was. They marched right in, opened up the veil. I've defeated the people, therefore I've defeated their God. He opened it up and there was nothing there. Think of his disappointment. What if, I'd be quite disappointed too. If I was going to march in there, the anticipation rising up in me and then I opened up, boom, there's nothing there. What was the big deal? What's this big deal? What's this God all about? He saw nothing but an empty room. You know, it doesn't so much, much matter about the temple so much as what's in the temple. They say that the they say that the Herod's temple. They say in, in the history says that they say that Herod's temple was so glorious and there was so much gold that at nighttime it would glow. It like it, it, it absorbed all the light. It would glow even at nighttime, the darkest of night. That the temple glowed. A beautiful, magnificent thing. No wonder when it's, they, the, the disciples said, hey, look at this. Look at this beautiful thing here. You know, look at this. Look at look what we have done here. Jesus Christ said, hey, there's not going to be one stone here. There's not going to be thrown down. You know? This physical temple doesn't mean anything. Hallelujah. The outward beauty of Solomon's temple is far more grand than the tabernacle in the wilderness. Its beauty was known throughout the world. I would ask you tonight, what would the non-Christians in your life, what would they think if they saw behind the veil of your life? I'm just, I'm just going to be real. I, I want to I see souls saved. <laughs> if I could just say one thing tonight, that would help somebody grow closer to God than I, I think I've done what I needed to do. But I sincerely believe that the Lord is wanting to deal with somebody tonight about their situation, where they're at. It's not so much what we put on, it's what we have inside. And the outward should be a reflection of, of the inward. And in that temple, they didn't have anything inside it. Hallelujah. It's a frightening thing that in those days that the, when Jesus Christ came on the scene, he, he called the, the, the religious people of that day whited sepulchers, you know, a, you know, full of dead men's bones. That'd be a frightening thing, you know, to think that, you know, I've got it right and I'm saved, to think that I've, I've got it just the way I'm supposed to have it and to be lost without God. I mean, to, to really be fooled to thinking that I'm saved. I mean, Eli, what, what, I mean, just to think Eli, he had every opportunity, every opportunity to get it right. His sons, every opportunity to live a good life. And because they're high-minded, they grabbed the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they lost it, and they lost their lives. You know, and I think that many times we as Christians, we do the exact same thing spiritually, metaphorically speaking. We're, we're exactly the same way. Oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm a Christian. Oh, oh I'm a, no, I'm better, better now. I'm a Pentecostal, right? We're real good about putting on our Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Well, y'all might be good. I'm not very good at it. 
People go, like, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, well, it's, like, it's Brother Bybee in me, but I need less of Brother Bybee and more Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But let's be real today. I mean, are you putting on your holiness? Or are you letting the inward holiness be a reflection of, of your outward expression of who you are? What would people see? Will people really see the Holy Ghost in you? And the problem is, is that, you know, we've become, and I say we because I throw myself in there, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, but we've become, we've become professional critics. Fault finders. Professional fault finders. Hallelujah, I'm a contractor. I'm going to find every fault in your foundation. I hate to say it, but God never called me to be a fault finder. God, I'm not a fruit inspector either. God, that's his business, not mine. Hallelujah. Now, if you got rotten fruit, and you know, hey, we need to do some pruning here. Hallelujah. Really, it's not our job. You know, my job, my, my, my calling is to preach the gospel, to win souls, and, and to live for God the best I can. Hallelujah. But people around you are watching you. Hallelujah. You know, John... In, in, in chapter 14 of John, I've, I spoke with this. I don't want to get too much trouble, but John chapter 14 of John, Brother Bumgarner, I think when I, when he and I agree, oh, uh, I think, oh, brother here uh, may not, might jump me out the hallway when we're done, but he says, let your heart, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, uh, believe uh, in, also in me, right? In my Father's house are many mansions, Hallelujah. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah. Now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight because I might get, Pastor might get in trouble. I might, get, I might, I might get, I'll probably get set down for a while, but so I'm going to say it anyway. In my father's family, that word family, that word house also means family. It implication, it means family. In my father's family are many mansions, are many abodes, many dwelling places. In my father's house are many mansions, or in my father's family are many dwelling places. He was talking about going and dwelling in the heart of the believer. Hallelujah. Being tabernacled within you in this earth. Hallelujah. Wow, that's exciting. Hallelujah. Is that okay? Well, maybe not. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, amen. But let me ask you, can sin dwell in the same tabernacle as Jesus Christ? No, he can't. I mean, just, but let me ask you, I th he does tolerate it for a while, I think, doesn't he? I mean, when I got first baptized, when I was baptized in Jesus' name, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I didn't come up out of that water looking right, acting right, talking right, and everything. I had some things God was still working out in me, right? Hallelujah. But God gives me a space of time to repent. Hallelujah. He keeps working on me, amen. As I get convicted, I begin to let things go. I begin to pick up things up. Hallelujah. I'm thankful we serve a, a merciful God and a long-suffering and patient God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I better hurry up. For the old camp, well, I'll be hearing lubies. Hurry up, we're going to lubies. Oh. No. <laughs> Hallelujah, you know what I'm talking about, all. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. We become professional critics and fault finders. And it, we need to be careful not to do that. Amen. We find ourselves accusing rather than excusing somebody else. You know, um, I would rather cover my brother's sin than, than, than magnify it. Yeah, I think, and that makes me think back when, remember old Noah? I heard a couple drunks talking the other day about, oh, I know, when he got done, he grew up a vineyard. They're drunk, they're drunk, they're saying he got a vineyard, he got some wine, they started drinking, these old drunks are talking about Noah. Man, it's the funniest thing, I'm watching this on YouTube, you know, like, my Lord. Talk about stretching it, you know, oh, yeah, Jesus turned water to wine, too. I mean, these guys are like, woo, hey. They're out there, been drinking too much of that moonshine, you know. But, you know, I think about, 
you know, two of his, one of his sons came back to talk to his brother. Said, "Hey, look, I seen Dad. He was, Dad was up. He was in there. He's drinking. He's getting all, he's getting all sliced up. Come check this out. He's all naked. And he's laying around the tent. He's talking about, you know, all this other kind of stuff, you know. And what does two other brothers do? Man, they won't go look at their brother, their father's nakedness like that. They just, they got, they got a blanket. And they've been walk backwards. They've been covering the brother, their father's sin. Hallelujah. Amen. But too many times." You want to jump into the bandwagon, hallelujah, and say, oh, look at Brother Bidey. Oh, I went over to his house. Man, he's got stinky socks laying around his office. You ought to see it. He's got Harley Davidson magazines, and he's got dirty wrench right next to his plate. Amen. He, don't, he, don't, he lets his kids run around, sling the diaper all over the house. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Now, I would appreciate you just grabbing that old spiritual blanket, amen, and take a few steps backward and begin to cover my sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to tell you something. If God's letting you see that, God's, God, oh, I know it's going to preach. Hallelujah. I'll probably get in trouble again about something else. That's okay. Hallelujah. But let me tell you something. If God's show, if you're seeing something about somebody else, it's not so you can criticize them. It's so you can pray for them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you come to Brother Bobby, you're going to say, hey, Brother Bobby, I've seen Brother Bumgarner, and he's this and he's that. I'm going to tell you that. Okay, well, let's pray about it. Hallelujah. Oh, that's not what you want to hear. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about it. No, I want to talk about it. Let's pray about it. Talk about what you don't want to hear. Hallelujah. That's not what I want. That's not really what I want to hear, Brother Bobby. I want to hear Let's talk about it. No, I don't want to talk about it. I want to pray about it. Hallelujah. Oh, but to disagree with the words of Scripture, Paul, what did he say about it? He said, with you are spiritual, restore such a one. You're so spiritual. See, we've got too many people pretending to be spiritual, but they're not spiritual. They're carnal. If you're spiritual, you don't even put on your spirituality and begin to wear it around the church. Hallelujah. If anybody can do that. God sees that. And God sees what's in, too. Hallelujah. But if you really want to be spiritual, you're going to find a place to pray. Hallelujah. And that spiritual man inside you is going to, is going to, is going to move you to pray. I'm just saying. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about what we got on the outside. I'm talking about what we got on the inside. Hallelujah. Well, I probably said hallelujah 15 million times. I wish I had, if I give me a quarter every time I say Hallelujah. I don't, I don't like that. You know, I heard these guys are, oh, hallelujah this, hallelujah that. I don't like, I mean, I'm being my best critic. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll throw an amen there. Or I'll say glory. Well, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't want to get, please don't get mad at me. Please don't get mad at me. I know, I know some people are in here right now. They're thinking, oh, I'm mad at you now, Brother Bobby. Sister, I love you, sister. I love you, family. Y'all been, y'all, this has been a, I, I don't know anybody in here that I don't like. Well, my wife sometimes, but I still like her. No, I'm just kidding. There's not one person in this church I don't like. And you could, you could beat me down spiritually, and, and I'd just be like, what I do? Because getting back to my title here. When you meet me, what you see is what you get. And that's really who, where we need to be. We don't need to be a glorious temple with nothing in it. Hello? Hello? I mean, last time I checked, I was a temple made without hands. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so when I see sin and when people get to gossip and talk to me, or begin to present things to me that are ungodly, hallelujah. Guess what? I begin to feel a little convicted. Now, there might be times in your life that you might just kind of yield to sin. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you like this, okay? I'm not your pastor. That's okay. You want to know why? Because if you've got the Holy Ghost, you'll repent about it. And you'll correct yourself about it. And you might find the Holy Ghost just might do his job before you get on the phone and call the pastor and confess to him. Then you might be talking to the pastor next week and say, hey, guess what? 
I had a problem. But before I called you, I prayed about it. Hallelujah. I repented already. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> That'll work. Makes your job a whole lot. I mean, how long will God tolerate sin in the tabernacle, sin in the camp? How long is he going to tolerate it? And this is really what I want to get to tonight. I want to talk to somebody directly to your life. And I want to tell you that you can be deceived just like the children of Israel were deceived. When they think they had it all right. They thought they were doing God's service when they persecuted the church. I mean, look in the book of Romans. I'm sorry, I'll go there, but I might get here we go again, brother Bob. Gonna get trouble. Now I got my friend up there in 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 uh, Chattanooga. I went and preached a weekend for him. We had a good time. Oh man, we had some good church. And I was I just started I just got crazy with it. But God was using me. And I was talking. I was dealing with the right to people. A small church. You know, when you're preaching in a big church, I can say something. It could be very general. I, I, I don't do that, but I could. You know what I mean? But we're talking like we have like 20 people in there. There's like 20 like small church. So I said something. I better be on the mark, you know. <laughs> and uh, we had some good church, you know, and, and uh, I always enjoy it. But I certainly do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to warn somebody today. Don't be deceived. There are conditions to being saved. Don't be deceived. Like I said before, we could think we're saved and we're not saved. We'll go around thinking we're saved when we're not. And our biggest problem is we like to put on our salvation, right? And rather have it in here, we like to put it on. Show everybody. That's something I got to learn to do. I got to learn to start acting like I'm saved. <laughs> a lot of times I, you know, I, I like to cut it up and have a good time. I, I mean, this brother right here probably get in more trouble if we got hung, hung out together. He'd probably get me into trouble. We're inside, we're inside Chick-fil-A one day. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, ah, this guy's, he's talking to the waiter there. He goes, yeah, this is a great man of God. He'll, he'll preach to you and you'll repent things you ain't done yet. I'm thinking, does this guy know him or something? I'm like, oh, hallelujah. But, you know, in the book of Romans, Paul was dealing with him. And he, he, you, know, th 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 this, you know, look at this. He says, uh, uh, look at verse, verse 20. He says, for the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly, uh, are clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made. Even as eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Who? Look at this. Being that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made a corruptible man, like a bird, a four-footed beast, and creeping things. Hello? You know what that tells me? Beast-like nature. Oh, yeah, everybody wants to talk about, oh, the, the number of the beast. Number, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably show, don't record this. You know, but they always, they always talk about the number of the beast. Number of the beast, you know, 666, the mark, the chip, all this kind of stuff. Hey, what about the seal of God? What, what, why don't you guys get off the bandwagon of the beast-like nature, man, and why don't you start focusing on the seal of God being sealed upon your forehead? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For every time you take Mark of the Beast, I want you to say, Seal of God, Seal of God, Seal of God. Hallelujah. That'd be a great thing, wouldn't it? Every time somebody talks about Mark of the Beast, you say, Hey, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Then people stop saying Mark of the Beast. I'm not concerned about them, no Mark of nothing. The beast like nature, man, carnal, unregenerated. Hallelujah. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be saved. Hallelujah. But here he's talking about this thing. Look at this. Verse 25 says, Who changed the, tru uh, the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves the recompense of their error which was meat even, even even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind that is one of the most frightening things you could face for your life think about it you're so we get so busy criticizing our brother we lose our Holy Ghost because God's not going to tolerate too much of that I mean I can understand brother Webb Man, you made me mad. You took off with, you know, uh, some of my 
my shells went hunting and you got my boots in your, your truck and everything. And, God, you know, and you just really need to learn to keep your truck cleaner. Just made me, you know, just, I'm talking about criti criticism, criticism, criticism. How much do you think that God's going to tolerate? Then you come to church, you go, oh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, oh, praise the Lord, oh, oh praise the Lord. And, and, then, and you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And then, then we're not being sincere. I'm talking about being real. What you see is what you get when you meet Brother Bybee. And if you would stand me to my face and say, man, look, brother, you're wrong about something. You know what I'm going to do? I'll tell him, well, brother, you're wrong. No, I'm just... But you tell you come and stand my, to me in my face, I'll, I'll repent. I really will. I would expect that you would too. I mean, excuse me for being so simple-minded to think that we're a family and that we all have faults and that we're all trying to get to the same place. Hallelujah. And I want to be saved. And I don't think you want to be any less saved than I want to be. Oh, amen. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Well, hey, you know, brother, brother came preach 15 minutes for me so I can get out early. I'm just kidding. He's serious, I don't get it. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just saying, but is it too much to ask to say this? Is it too much to, to say or too much to live this simple? What you see is what you get. Being if you're going to portray something, don't be try to be no more and don't try to be any less. Matter of fact, I try to be less as I am. Because I, I personally don't think highly of myself. And you know what? I don't think any of us should really think highly of ourselves. We should esteem others above ourselves. If we, had more, if we had more of that attitude, esteeming others above our own selves, I think we would find that we would be elevated at the same time. Hallelujah. That's just how it works. That's just how it works. I mean, I didn't, I never, you know, Lord knows. I married my wife. She, she told me afterwards she didn't want to marry a preacher. I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. She told me she didn't want to marry a preacher, but I said, well, you're in trouble. Then I tell you this, I thought that was in the clause. <laughs> you know, but it's been a good ride. We've been doing all right. Hallelujah. And, and, and her parents, when I met their, them, boy, I thought, man, when I was, I was marrying into saints, they've been living for God for de decades. And I thought, man, this is going to be great. I come right up out of the pagan garbage that I was raised in, and here I am going to be married into some Christian family. Man, boy, I got a revelation. After I got married, after a while, I realized that Christian families aren't perfect. I realize Christian families, they don't all read their Bible. Uh-oh. I guess you all read your Bibles then, huh? Hallelujah. Once a week, I read my Bibles once a week. <laughs> Hallelujah. And her, her, her family, one of the things that their parents had to deal with when they met me, and I use myself as an example, is when I got saved, I really didn't have anything. I, I was really just, I, I wanted to die. And so for me, for someone like that, it's easy just to, to give up and just to say, well, I'm giving it you all, Lord. I'm going to give it all to you because I got nothing else. And so, yeah, maybe it's easier for Brother Bybee to say, this is the way you need to be. What you see is what you get. How, how, how do you think it's, how much easier do you think it is for the potter to take the clay if he can see the stubble on the rocks he's got to take out and if you keep trying to hide it he's trying to work it out and you keep trying to hide all this stuff and try to try to keep this stuff in your life and he's trying to put you on the pause well next thing you know he grabs that clay he's going to slam it against the wheel because he's got to get that stuff out hallelujah and you wonder well god why am i going through this why are all these things happening to me hello god's trying to work some things out in your life because you said i want to be saved and that's all you needed to say. Game over, Doc. He, 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 he's he's going to handle the business. And uh, her parents, my, my, and I, I, pick, I'll, I pick on them a lot when I preach, and they're, you know, y'all know when they see me, but, they, you know, they love me probably more than they love their own kids. 
you know, I'm the son that they never had. And they, uh, you know, but one of the things they really had a hard time with me is, is when they first met, when they first met me, I, I really didn't have much shame in my game. I would, I would go to a restaurant, I'd stand up, walk across the room and talk to anybody about anything, anytime. I had no problem. Because when you've just thrown in your life, your life doesn't mean anything and your life isn't yours anymore, literally, it doesn't bother you. I'm not ashamed to go talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. And yeah, I didn't have a lot of tact. I'm just talking about me. I don't have a lot of tact. I mean, I'm still kind of learning, you know. But I've learned not just to get up, stand on the on the stool in the bar, and start, you know, hollering out, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. That doesn't really get people to come to church, okay? I tried at Walmart. Walmart doesn't do it either. <laughs> but when I, when, I first, when I first met him, we go into Waffle House, and, and uh, I just I hear someone say Jesus, and boom, my, eyes, my ears perk up. I start looking around. Oh, hey. How you doing? Praise God. I get real loud. He said, why do you get so loud? I said, I don't know, because I'm called to preach. I want everyone to hear me. Hallelujah. You know, and, and uh, it, it embarrassed me. They learned to deal with me, and I learned to mellow out. We found a, 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 a happy medium, right? They go out with me only when we go to very loud restaurants like Texas Roadhouse. They don't have a problem. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> they just blend in. It's loud in this place. <laughs> I'll be going, hi, how you doing? Praise God. Yeah, I like a steak. You want to come to church? <laughs> Hallelujah. No, seriously, but, you know. <laughs> well, y'all been there with me. You know I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> but it's easy for me. And I'm not saying this is an easy thing for everybody. But it's something we all need to work on. You need to sincerely ask yourself, is this temple really what you want it to be, Lord? There was five things that, was, that were supposed to be in the tabernacle at that time. I'm, I'm looking for my notes here, but I, I was looking. There was five, five, five articles that, that were required inside the tabernacle. Um... One was the ark. The other was the sacred fire. That sacred fire I spoke of earlier about, you know, Eli had allowed that to um, extinguish. Of course, the Holy Spirit. Urim and Thurmim. 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 Urim and Thurmim. Okay. It, I don't know what they are. It's some kind of stone. It's a part of the breastplate. It had something to do with the breastplate of, of, of judgment. I began to study what those things were. I began. I like showing people. I was I threw in at Brother Waddy earlier. I said, hey, look, you know what this is? And I know because I don't know what it is, so I'm pretty sure he don't know what it is. So I thought, yeah, you know. I know. I just, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. No. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm like, I really want to know, but I found that it's, you know. Anyway, but those articles were the things that were required inside the holiest of holies. And when when... When Pompey comes in, there's nothing there. So let me ask you, if, if your heart was open today so all could see, what would be in there? What would be dwelling in the tabernacle of your life? I no longer believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, I believe he died on the cross, but when he died on the cross, the, 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 the Bible tell, teaches us that the, the veil was rent inside Herod's temple. It wasn't Solomon's, it was Herod's temple, okay? And I, I hardly believe that the presence of God, because there's no evidence anywhere in Scripture or in history that tells me that the power of God ever fell on that tabernacle or in that temple, and that temple was ever accepted by God. There's nothing in Scripture, nothing in history that tells me that that was ever accepted by God, though it was a system that obviously did not displease Him. But I never know that the Spirit fell there. There's no, no evidence. It's interesting. But when, the, 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 when he died, it says that the, 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 some tore that veil. What was the purpose? The, exactly. The purpose of that, that, that veil being rent was so we could see what was behind it. Absolutely nothing. That the center focus of your worship and your adoration and your love was not to be at a temple, a physical temple this world, but it was to be to Him, the one and true and only, hallelujah, who when He died and sacrificed His blood, it fell upon the earth. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brought the heaven and earth together. Hallelujah. Oh, I get off in the heavens and earth. You know, I like to do that. Hallelujah. That the people could see. No longer, no longer were they deceived. Hallelujah. I'm grateful today. Let me ask you. Has this been good? I want to warn somebody tonight. I don't know who it is. I'm, you wanna, I'm, not, I'm not like one of these, you know, what do you call the uh, verbal bean or one of those guys that like, I'll pick on Brother Patterson because I know him. You better watch out. I'm not going to say that. You better not cry. I like to have a good time in church. Is that okay? But I want to warn somebody today. Hallelujah. You better check your Holy Ghost. You better check your Holy Ghost. You better check who you are. Because if your life is so complicated that what you see is not what you get, Brother Bobby, you just don't understand. I am just a, so complex of a person that you just can't understand me. I want to be saved. And the simplicity of that is I need to keep a repentant heart. And when God is dealing with me, I need to yield to the Spirit of God and, and repent of my sin. And as the brother said, and I, I repented when he said it, repentance is not confession. That's Catholic. Repentance is to stop and turn around and go the other way and no longer do it any longer. Hallelujah. Boy, when that old boy said that, I was just like, oh, 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 oh. I got to repent again. I got to repent all over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. I'm going to open the altars here in a minute. I, you know, I want to warn somebody, though. Please, I don't sound the trumpet, but if you've been deceived today, if you think you just got it right, I got it right. Check yourself. Do you find yourself being critical about your brother or your sister? Because you just might find yourself being deceived. With all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them that perish. For they hold not a love for the truth that they might be saved. That God will send them strong delusions to believe a lie. That's church people being deceived by God. Because they will not yield to the presence and the calling of God. At a simple altar. Hallelujah. Where the mother rubber meets the road as our Savior came from heaven he yielded he submitted and he laid down his life hallelujah and that blood that everlasting cleansing flow fell to the earth amen that we might have access into the holiest of holies forevermore. Hallelujah. Will you come and come to the altar? If it's you, you feel as if I was speaking to you, I'm gonna, I plead with you today, please, please do not leave this place until you've got a hold of God. I've got things in my life. I've got situations. God, I need help. Hallelujah. Lord, make Hallelujah.